Someone wants to claim universality and objectivity for their computer music things, that'll be a pretty nice discussion for the next 40 minutes. Um, <laughs> I have a lot of arguments against that. Um, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, the piece I'm going to talk about, there are a couple pieces. One is, one is called uh, Virtual Discourse. Um, virtual Discourse started out uh, in a very curious way, uh, there, there's, a, there's a controller, for lack of a better term, called Lightning. It's made by Buchla and Associates. And Lightning is basically in uh, infrared uh, uh, transmit. And there's a receiver sort of up, up there somewhere. You sort of wave it around, and it can follow your, track your movements up and down, or it can, it can respond to force gestures in two dimensions. Over. And you can sort of go like this. And pretty soon, once you start using it for a while, you start to find out that everyone has a very different way of, of showing who they are in terms of what their body is doing by using this very simple um, device. So that what I started to see was something that, um, well, maybe I should show you how this works in practice. This is a piece for for percussion players, um, classically trained percussionists who don't improvise, at least not in this, at least not in this formation of um, quartet. And there, I, I, I guess I took it upon myself, they asked me to write them a piece for percussion. And I said, well, maybe, God, do I really want to see a bunch of drums and cymbals and stuff? How about a virtual percussion piece? What about that? And they seemed to think that was a good idea. So that was the idea. <laughs> that's what we came up with. So the idea is that each one has two of these wands, and they use them in the manner of percussion players, because this is what this is a primary experience that they have with their bodies. So I didn't know whether this would really work. So we're using sort of sampled sounds, and at a certain point, I said, well, can you guys do like a roll on the drums, right? And so they said, well, let's try it. Sounds good to me. They said, yeah, they said oh, wait a minute now. Hold on. I thought a roll was something where you had to bounce off of this. You know, they're doing it in the air. There's no drum there at all. It's making this roll. I thought a drum was that you had to hit the drum. And, you know, in other words, I didn't know anything about you know, the drum. You know, I didn't know. I thought it was just some physical thing. You have, to, you have to strike a body, a, a body surface, and have it bounce off. But in fact, what the drum, it's sort of exactly what Michael Carvin, the jazz drummer, told me when he, um, Came to a rehearsal with Sound Rivers Orchestra, and he didn't bring his drums, but he brought a set of he brought a set of drumsticks, and he took a metal chair from the uh, room and started playing on it. And it really sounded extraordinary. The band sounded fabulous. It swung. It did all these great things. I said, "Well, how are you doing this with a chair?" He said, "Well, man, the drummer is here." <laughs> <laughs> and so that's really what it is. <laughs> so this is where the drummer is, and so that's what the, that's part of the point of this, and that's why. Right. Show it, um, we'll have a chance to think about sort of. I, I have a lot of interpretations of what this means, but um, it's better to show it first and then, and then you can compare your interpretation with mine uh, instead of getting the approved version first. Um, I hope this is on. Oh, there we are. Oh, <laughs> 
aesthetic and cultural stance about what represents something interesting to do with computers and what's and what's interesting and what kinds of sounds are considered meaningful. And, and there, you know, there is a thing in the computer music world. There's a kind of a hi-fi metaphor about sort of a reified idea, really quite essential about what good sound is. Okay, which has been totally smashed by current day electronic and you know Detroit techno and its, and its uh, aftermath and so on. The idea of what constitutes good sound, but certainly in the avant-garde sort of um, highly technocratic uh, modernist world of, of music, there is this notion there. And this really smashes that, I think. It really doesn't pay any attention to it. And the other big fashion in that musical world is the notion that we we really should, the, the, the right way to do computer music is to think about timbre, and timbre becomes the big thing. Um, so that there's this sort of deracinated, disembodied notion of what timbre is. And it was very different from the notion of sound, which I'm talking about. Sound is being a mark of personality, and for, in particular, the connection with the body, which we don't seem to need when we talk about this, um, this uh, disembodied notion of timbre. So what, again, what constitutes correct timbres to use, and normally things that don't really have much... Well, to put it another way, um, we apparently I heard about Earl Hines going to a, a concert at the school where I teach, which is a school that sort of specializes in European modernist music. And um, they took Earl Hines to a concert of his music and asked him his opinion. He said, well, I liked it, but if I was doing it, I'd put some rhythm to it. And so that really is where I'm kind of at with this, which is to say that it's time, for me, the point was not to develop slowly moving terrible spaces and have that be the nature of it, but to have a kind of a, a dialogic articulated conception where people are actually, as you can see, each one of these people really has a very different way of using these instruments. And they sort of, they sort of express who they are through these things. And they start to, they start to generate their own way of looking, their own look, their own feel, their own sound. Uh, everyone sounds completely different, even when they're playing the same group of sounds, or they're, or they're triggering the same samples, to use the, the summary of the, of the terminology. So, what we've got really is that most of the people who were looked at the piece really mainly concentrated on the problems they had with the technological replacement of the, of the percussion instruments by virtual counterparts. Okay, um, and you see, really, that seems to be. Uh, and I saw it looking at the people because I saw it. <laughs> In other words, I didn't want to think about things that weren't there. In other words, there were no drums there, so there was no reason for me to wish that there were any drums there. In other words, what, what were the people doing? And how, in other words, the idea is that if, if I was just doing this in a space and there's no sound, that's a really different thing. But suddenly when I've got this thing and I'm expecting a sound, and when I do this, I'm expecting something to happen, and when I do that, or if I'm doing that, and I'm expecting something to happen, I've got a connection there, I've got a sense of touch, I've got a haptic sense that's being, that's being uh, articulated. And so that for me, I was interested in seeing that happen. So in a way, and, and also, also, of course, little three times, little sorts of, also, besides that, um, I was also interested in seeing uh, people do things like turn pages and do all sorts of other sort of like classical music things. <laughs> because it's, it's, in a certain sense, it's, it's an ironic sort of signifying playing the dozens with classical music is what I love to do. And, um, and so that's one thing that sort of happens in the piece. But, but you see, the idea is that no one is really touching anybody, but there is a, a sense of touch there so that you start to see that if you do if you do this and you don't get the response, you could be injured. That's how intense the situation is. Um, so that is um, so for me the idea of having having the virtual discourse is, is rather than the so-called actual discourse or real instruments sitting there is connected with the idea that I just want to see bodies in space moving. And the score amounts to a kind of choreography, more or less, or which is to say a timeline, a timeline of of activities and motions, and to sort of see how those motions reflect the people who are doing them and what their histories are, and to do that in a space where there wasn't improvisation, where is to say that we don't actually, you know, this is where I kind of disagree with the idea here. There's an idea expressed in here somewhere about how improvisation is somehow an important part of this process of personality, of, of articulated personality through the body, and I sort of don't think so. And um, I sort of have the feeling that you, I think I, I think I can see from something like this 
that people are playing this completely more or less determined piece, and yet there is this notion that I can pick out personalities, and that personalities are intersecting and interacting, and communicating about how to play the piece, and also communicating some of the problems with the interface as well, like when things don't happen on time, and so on. Um, so that's um, part one um, about, the, about that piece. Um, and now there's part two is coming up. Um, back to animism. Um, the, the idea of dialoguing with um, this, this is a little different piece. There's another piece called Voyager, which is an old piece, which has uh, been retired now, but I'm still kind of playing it. So I'm going to play you an example of what happens there. Um, essentially, I start to discover in... Well, I'll, put it, I'll, I'll tell you the story. I, in, 1980, in 1982, I went to IRCON, which is the place in France where they do a lot of this highly technocratic music. And um, I went there to make a piece, which ended up being the sort of forerunner of the piece I'm playing for you now. And uh, I began to discover um, that things were not as they seemed. In other words, um, computer music was not a socially objective space where one, if one was using computers, one was doing computer music, that in, in fact, uh, people were using computers in many different ways as, uh, in a scientific way, as a marker of personal power and authority. Um, there seemed to be a very important strain of that. And there also seemed to be um, cultural markers embedded in the methodology. In other words, that at that time, if you read a book like Georgina Bourne's book on Intercom, there were the computers. Now, and then there was this notion of small systems versus big systems, which mapped very neatly at the time on the notion of tape and live. In other words, live, live people use small systems, tape people use big systems. Of course, big systems have disappeared, so now this is a big system. So, uh, so that, whole, that whole sort of uh, mine is bigger than yours thing just went right out the door. And, um, so, but, but we're still left with the live, we're still left with various notions of what it means to work with computers in a live setting. And what we start to find is that for me, at least, the fault line came down onto the notion of compo and improv. That is to say, composed and improvised ways of investigating a musical uh, form. Um, so that in the case of Voyager, um, there is, well, of course, they're both involved. For example, you have this computer program, which is more or less determined. I mean, it has a form. It has a, it's, you know, it has a good 10,000 lines of shit that I had to write, and so sort of that's how it works. And so, um, but then in performance, it's doing these things that are, what would you call them? I call them unpredictable, but unpredictable is really a pretty cheap way of getting um, uh, variety. I, I prefer to work with them. <laughs> well, I mean, unpredictability is very easy to do. I mean, I could do that right now. I could overturn the table. I could choke somebody. I can do any number of things. But there's sort of a notion of plausibility connected within that. So that the plausible and the unpredictable tend to work together. So we start to see a range of possible behaviors, which is a big set, and then a range of kind of behaviors that seem, that seem to work in the space. So that we start to find that, well, 80% of the time it does this, but 20% it does this other very interesting thing which you didn't expect somehow. But you didn't expect it because it had been doing this other thing all the time, which was normally the expected thing. So this combination of doing the expected thing and suddenly branching out with something unexpected is sort of like, it's sort of, a, it's sort of something you have to manage. And believe it or not, the, my favorite way of managing it is to use random numbers. Which is to say, if you use enough of them, and if you use them um, judiciously, you can sort of tune this thing to sort of get, you're sort of composing more or less. What you're doing is you're composing a behavior, and then you send that behavior out into space, and, and you sort of work with it and dialogue with it. So that's what happens. The other side of it, I started to realize when I got there, was that, um, well, I liked different sounds from those Europeans. I liked to have a lot of different sounds happen at the same time. I wanted to have a lot of cross rhythms. You know, I didn't really have any use for sort of floating timbre spaces. I found them boring, I'm just saying. I, would, I didn't mind having multiple rhythms going like a follow this one or that one, but the idea of sort of floating in space and sort of playing these sort of, uh, you know, fake serial stuff, I just, didn't, I, just I, wasn't, I just wasn't going to do it. And so that sort of separated me off, and I didn't really know why I was so separated. And I realized, oh, that's right, I'm an African American. That explains it. Ah. 
Now I've got it. So anyway, I'm coming into the, the pan-European space. That is to say that regardless of whether you're in Argentina or whether you're in Brazil or whether you're in San Diego or, or whether you're in Paris or wherever, it, it, there, there are similar codes tending to go on. Um, the differentiation is much less to an outsider or a putative outsider, such as myself, than you might suspect. I mean, at least from that outsider's point of view. So that we, and especially when you start to see that certain people or styles or forms of music were immediately considered suspect just because of their ethnic origin, they started to realize that um, that um, that there was a, a social model of computer music along with the technological model, and the social model really, in a sense, determines what the technological model was going to be, or else had really one of the major influences in which technologies would be followed up and which technologies would be discarded. So, but that's no big deal. But it just had you just had to be reminded of it in case you thought it was an objective quest for truth. You know, uh, <laughs> you just had to say, well, I guess it wasn't that, was it? Um, so, in any event, what I end up doing in Voyager is kind of appropriating uh, some of the sounds, appropriating the 19th century concerto model, and more or less creolizing it, if you want to put it really. <laughs> That's what ends up happening in the piece. And so, what I'll do is I'll kind of play a bit of that for you. I'll play the, the last piece. One of the things that I, I would, before I do, I'll just say that I was. Um, for about about 30 years, I've been a member of this group called the Association of the Advancement of Creative Musicians, and I and I worked pretty carefully with a person named Roscoe Mitchell, who introduced me to David Russell, who's sitting there, and I was say, "Hello, oh, David, how are you?" <laughs> we'll talk tomorrow, I guess, the day after. And um, the thing is that this is Roscoe Mitchell playing the saxophone, and he's kind of the um, he's kind of dialoguing with the system, and. Um, this is one piece out of eight, and the pieces are improvised and so on. Um, one of the things that has tended to distance me a little bit from a couple of areas, in other words, I could say personally that I'm in kind of a, what would you call it, a spiritual quest? Let's put it that way, a spiritual quest. You know, I'm sort of thinking, well, what shall I do about this question of spirituality in, in life? And, but I realized that one of the things I don't want to do is I don't want to be a part of any spiritual tradition that won't let me come from the south side of Chicago. Where I have to, <laughs> in other words, where I have to suddenly say, well, I have to suddenly become something other than who I was to start out with. Where I can't bring my mother and father and my friends and my histories into the space and do that. And it's sort of, to me, it's the same with computer music. I, you know, I don't want computer music to turn me into a white guy, you see. And so this, not because I, not because that's a problem being a white guy, but it's just I'm just not I'm just not what I am. So that because of that, I would like I would like the computer to let me explore my own personality and extend it on my terms. That is, if I want to decide to explore my this, I want to be able to decide to do that, not be forced to do it by the technology. Okay. So that basically, when this little text says that, the, the part of the text that says that it's important that the musician and the composer should be one and the same person and why this person should also be responsible for the development of electronic instruments. Well, I would have to sort of go along with that to this extent, to the extent that the development of the instruments reflects who the person is. And that finally one is looking for a kind of personal technology that allows one's history to, to uh, be expressed using technology or using it or interacting with it or somehow relating yourself to it. Um, so I'm gonna we'll play this piece, which is about I think three or four minutes and then we'll have some final remarks. Um, didn't want to talk for a long how long have I talked yet? We don't know. Okay. More than um, two. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Play the page. Okay. <laughs>
anyway, now this is um, um, basically, um, I like to play that one because uh, for me, that's about as, as far away from the earcom model of computer music as you can be. And it's in the, you're not even the same, not in the same planet. And there are a lot of really reasons for that that stem from the fact that I'm who I am. And that I really found, in a sense, that I had to develop software that let me reflect that. Um, and, and really, without necessarily... What I learned as I got older, that I, that I could sort of like um, try to listen to what other people had to say <laughs> and try to incorporate that and not be quite as afraid of it. But that I found that the, there was so much so many ideas that were kind of designed to tell me how to think rather than tell me how to realize what I wanted to do. And so that finally, um, uh, it was the, 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 the basic idea of, of wanting to make software for myself, which is not something which I'm a natural at, it's more of a thing that's sort of a, you know, it's a very hard thing for me to do, um, is mainly that there is a, a, a sense of self-determination about that, a sense in which, um, and that's a very important thing for um, subaltern groups to be able to think about um, this kind of self-determination aspect. So, um, well, the thing is, I guess I, I guess this is where I'm going to end it for now, and, and maybe I've laid out enough sort of things that people to complain about. If you feel like complaining, go right ahead. <laughs> and I'm kind of here um, to, to to start. That's where I wanted to set the ball rolling for people who want to say things they want to say. You said that you finished saying that you wanted to find a technology or tool that allowed you to be yourself or to express yourself, right? Right, I can see that too. But before, uh, when you started off, you said that you wanted to find a technology that will uh, allow you to go somewhere else and express itself. That was more the idea of communication. You said something like um, uh, technology that takes a life different from you. Right. So yeah. you I don't see those as being no, um, no, as being you, as being yeah. opposed. Yeah. Could you, just, yeah. could you put them in um, Well, uh, let me. Let me let me sort of say it like this. I, I teach um, improvisation at the school where I'm you know, teaching. This. And one of the things that I start to notice is that when I first got there, musicians only wanted to play in large groups. And the reason why they only wanted to play in large groups was that they felt uncomfortable being themselves in the situation. And the reason why, for the most part, they felt uncomfortable being themselves is because they didn't feel they had a lot to say. You know, how do you develop having something to say? How do you develop who you are? Well, it's, it's a process of reflection. It's a process of dialogue with whatever these tools are. So that, and I'm not saying that that actually will result in that, but I'm saying that that is a path that I personally had to follow, that I saw that a lot of other people had to follow. So let's say you do that, okay, then you come into the space and you have something to offer, in other words, in the matter of dialogue or exchange. You know, you're not presenting yourself as someone who has nothing to offer in the space. So it seems to me that at least working on that aspect of yourself makes the makes the possibility of dialogue a little a, a little easier. Um, it, it sort of enhances that possibility. So that um, the the problem that I found with Voyager in a very curious way was precisely that people who weren't really good improvisers couldn't play with it. Because Actually, the software would beat them. <laughs> and so the thing is that, well, what it meant to be sort of good wasn't necessarily mean you were virtuosic or that you could play a lot of notes or whatever, but it meant you actually had a direction that you were trying to articulate. And that direction was somehow audible. And so that there became a notion of, like, for lack of a better term, the transduction of emotions from, from my standpoint came into play where things that one play came back in, in a form that sort of preserved some of what I felt was the emotional content, not necessarily the, morpho the morphology of the sounds in, in sort of caging terms, that is to say, uh, duration, uh, 
Pitt, et cetera, and Vaughan and Tamara, but more what those things are markers for, what I think of as the actual internal content of those things, where then finally if that is not preserved, then we get this disembodied or seemingly disconnected musical subjectivity. So I guess that's how I would connect them, that is that if you have a group of individuals who are bringing something to the space and they decide to interact with each other, part of what you bring to the space is the openness, and you have to work on that too. So that working on expression necessarily involves working on reception also. So I don't know if I would probably frame expression in terms of the way that controllers are framed, in terms of something I can do that makes sound for other people, instead of something I can hear that allows me to communicate. Yeah. Okay. I have to paraphrase a little bit this question, but please correct me if I'm wrong. You talked before about some of the technological models you encounter in terms of your composition in various countries and whatnot as actually being quite a social model when you come to discovery. That's correct. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what I think is a more overarching technological social model for most of the material that we'd be using in these kind of computer compositions, which is the kind of military research and development model that most of this is basically filtered down from. What role has that played in shaping the music and the type of musical model that we're actually all involved in? Because that's a very central power in terms of dropping these tools down into the general artistic public. Well, you know, I mean, these instruments are hardly the first technologies to come out of military research and be used for music. I mean, I can tell you the point of the saxophone and seeing one that really was made by a military contractor and somehow used. And you can point to its use in military bands and marching bands and then suddenly sort of creolized more or less again or sort of is intentionally subverted by these poor African-American people to use them for really very different purposes. So that when you start to see that, well, yes, there is a sense and you have to be fairly clear that we're dependent upon that complex for these devices. And if in a sense that people weren't trying to bomb this or that country, probably a lot of the stuff would not be here. And I'm not sure if there's a lot I can do about that from my position. I mean, maybe I could say, well, bomb less and we'll accept last year's model. You know, that's fine with me. But I want to only be able to afford last year's model. I'm not specifically asking if there's something you can do or we can do, but how does that affect what comes out? How does that affect? Well, I'm telling you the effect of it on me. I mean, maybe you'd like to tell me the effect on you. I mean, I'm not trying to provide answers for everyone. I'm trying to provide answers for myself. And I've told you that in essence, I don't see a lot that I can do on the level of music personally myself to affect that dialogue. I mean, the tools are here. Like a lot of tools in the universe, there is a notion of original sin connected with them. And it's just like it is the same with any other sort of thing that we encounter, that there's no pristine world in which these things would be separated. And I don't think I'm doing that. But I do have to notice that at a certain stage, we can still – well, you know, there's a theory that you can't use the master's tool to dismantle the master's house. I've seen that to be false. A number of slave uprisings have shown that that's false. Speaking of creolization of the technology, the last period of your comment when you were using personal computers to make music was the year they introduced the Macintosh to your comment. Yeah. And it was also the year in which the technical director volunteered his resignation because of the introduction of the Macintosh. It was a very – at least that moment in history, people were very aware of this contradiction in some sense for them, this misuse of technology and this appropriation of technology. It was right after you did your concert. Not exactly. Well, this concert was definitely a very transgressive act. You know, some people – I'm surprised that people weren't fired for it. Yet, what do you – somebody goes – someone's going to say something. Everybody's pretty tired here. Yeah. 
<laughs> yes, but I enjoyed the piece, but I couldn't detect uh, what was the uh, program. What, uh, uh, could you describe what you did to the program? I think? Enjoy it. How many people want to hear about that? <laughs> I mean, you know, I'll tell you, okay, I, okay, I can tell you, guys, that there's a lot of people I see. Otherwise, I just talk to you about it. <laughs> oh, no. I was teasing. Um, Especially talking about your relationship to time, because the way you deal with time from the outside rather than from the inside. I hope I can understand that. Can you tell me about that? Well, no, a lot of people who make AI music usually have this sort of internal time sense. The program determines time, and the improviser or the performer or the, the co-producer of music follows the time of the computer. Oh. No, that's not the case. Well, you know, but the computer has to have a sense of time. Mm -hmm. But it has to have a sense of its own time. It also has to have a sense of where other people are, too. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we all have to have here in order to do music, and you sort of have to create that. Um, I, I'm just going to say this in very broad outlines because I didn't want to go into, because I actually put this notion of software on a lot of different machines, so I want to talk about machines. I mean, some of them are more successful, others have been less successful. But um, it's been on a lot, of, as you know, it's been on a lot of different machines. Um, but I talked in terms of the process for me is that there needs to be. Um, a more or less independent device that is that is orchestrating, uh, melodizing, rhythmizing, doing all these sorts of things on the spot in real time. Okay, so that has to happen first. So once you create that thing, you kind of sit back and listen to it. You say, well, how does that work? And and basically, there are a lot of little decisions about about what kinds of melodic shapes to use, or how many instruments it should be used here, or what kinds of instruments should be used, or, or whether the rhythm should be jagged or smooth, and all this, there's a lot of little different little decisions. So what you wind up with is that I sort of look at it as a lot of little pots that I can sort of move. And I can say, well, I'm going to have this much of this, and this much of that, and this much of the other. We're going to have, most of the time, it's going to have, uh, there'll be very few instruments if, uh, if most if people aren't playing that way, so there'll be there'll be not as many kinds of instruments if people are playing smoother rhythms or sort of things like that end up being low level decisions which I'm making compositionally, but in a sense of I'm composing for a kind of behavior. Okay. So then the aggregate behavior over a long period of time becomes the thing that the the musician interacts with. And then you sort of have to build handles so that the musician can influence the <coughs> behavior, not control the behavior. And that's an important point. We don't want people saying, I don't want people telling the computer what to do um, or being able to being able to veto the computer's decisions. Um, I want it to be a space where if the computer makes a decision you don't like, well, that's just too bad. And you have to like work on that for yourself and sort of contemplate that and do, and do whatever you have to do. It's sort of like talking with anyone. If someone suddenly says something you don't understand or think is wrong, well, it's tough. It's been said. It's in the space, and as an individual who's living in real life, you have to deal with that. And that's sort of something which I sort of at pains to point out in the piece. So the piece is really not so much about computers. Once again, like the other piece, it's mainly about people, and it mainly uh, seeks to sort of, uh, <coughs> I'm encouraging empathy with the computer. I want people to empathize with it. I want people to, to see themselves in it in some way. Um, that could be a problem. Maybe it's an old-fashioned idea. Um, yes? In case the computer takes your way or it just ignore you, uh, can a computer fix ties with you? Well, a computer, you mean whose computer? Well, I mean, there's no a computer here. That's the universalizing discourse. I mean, there's, there's the, 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 the computer, a computer. You can tell my computer or yours. So, <laughs> to or with. Can it do what? Uh, well, it does something you don't like, or it, it throws obstacles in your way. You're trying to get to the court's place. You're mentioning before that the people who can deal with this performance environment are going to have a different direction in mind. So I envision, oh, well, there's this obstacle, a cable, I'll just dance around this obstacle in a certain way. I'm still heading off in the same direction. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you start recognizing these obstacles here? Is it, is it you start figuring out where the obstacles are and, and you start forming your own kind of uh, uh, sense of, of 
you know, how these obstacles are placed in the way of this part of, of the body. Yes, I would say that's probably something that happens when you interact with any independent subjectivity, which is to say that you're going to find that there are areas where you don't quite come together. And it's going to be basically your job to try to figure out what you're going to do about that. I mean, the other alternative is to have a dictatorship where you don't have to figure those things out, where you just say, well, do it my way or die. And of course, in extreme cases, there is always the off button. Um, <laughs> but but um, that's the difference between real time, real world, and sort of real time and real time, real world. So you don't have the off button. But, but I would say that in terms of these kinds of things, you start to see that over time, there are certain things, certain ways of playing that one's computer, one's constructed alternative personality might favor other other ways of playing that it doesn't like very much or doesn't understand, or, or I'm saying like in a metaphorical sense, saying really that in certain sense you, you don't you can't come together on it. Uh, there are times when the data is not being uh, interpreted. I mean, there's a there's a composite personality that's the sum total of everything that's going on. So that you know the, the data problems and transmission or little glitches in the output and, and so all these kinds of things end up becoming something that finally there's no end up becoming a kind of personality. And after playing with a machine like that for a while, um, you learn to know what that personality is and perhaps to anticipate things that it's likely to do. And then you can that means you know more about it. And just as if you're playing with another person, um, you can work with that. That becomes a part of your knowledge about that machine. Now, the interesting, now once again, we ask the question of, of reciprocity. And in this kind of piece, there could be reciprocity, but in this piece, there isn't. Not on that level. That's some, um, you know, I, I would, if I were like one of those real like hard-nosed people, I would say, well, we'll have that in six months. But, <laughs> but in fact, I'm likely never to have it because I don't understand how that works myself. So I'm going as far as I can go in terms of that. And I don't feel responsible for things that, that like that. But maybe, since no one else has done it either, I feel that I don't really have to worry about it. And if someone will eventually do it, that would be great. If they need to. Yes. Or who else wanted to? Go ahead. Uh, okay. You were saying? Sorry. No, no, no. Sorry. Uh, you, 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 uh, yeah. okay. I just thought you told about feminism. Yeah. I'm very interested in the, how, how, how can you this this concept uh, this uh, in the American culture uh, I think uh, again I mean, here in Holland, uh, very much difficult is uh, my own culture and fit it uh, into the Western European way of thinking mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'm asking it in this uh, in this in this one well I, I mean um, there's often been an atmospheric streak in American culture you know I mean, certainly in, certainly in, in black cultures and composite groups, there's a lot of things of that. So that you start to, and it's, it's reflected in all kinds of ways. I mean, one way in which you could think about it, look at glossolalia, or speaking in tongues. Look at that, look at the, the Pentecostal church where people suddenly get the spirit and they start to roll over, speak in tongues, lay on the floor. You know, I, I mean, these are the, um, these are the cultural roots of Coltrane, for example. So we listen to Coltrane doing these very fast passages. Just remember that he grew up in that kind of church. Um, so that we start to see that there's that streak is not hard to find. You don't you, you it's really very much it's not even that far from the surface. It's right there. And that's an important location for it. Um, certainly I grew up with those kinds of images of uh, seeing people kind of, you know, roll over and get crazy or get happy. And they call it getting happy. And so I think there is a strain of that in, in the American culture or in the hybrid American culture, that is to say, among the group of, of subcultures or areas of constant American culture, you could say that that's definitely present. But, but I, I don't know if that completely well, deals with the topic. into the English, English culture, in this uh, European shaped culture. America is not an English culture. Well, well, well that's, that's, an, that's an interesting thing. I said, well, that's quite a lot of I don't feel it. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. I mean, I think he's. I mean, Joel has a point there. That is to say that I don't necessarily see it as being a project of assimilating. 
into this overarching notion of, of what would you call it, uh, English or, or uh, in other words, everyone has their role to play. I mean, I mean, I don't know if you remember, someone mentioned Jung this morning, and one statement was attributed to him was that American white people uh, walk and talk and talk like black people. And he said that, and that was very true thing, which I think annoyed a number of people. Um, so that it's, so he, and him not being an American, being Swiss, and being racist, you um, that right away. Right? <laughs> um, uh, so, so, I guess what I'm saying is that um, I'm looking at it less from the standpoint of assimilation into some overarching constructed ideal, some sort of static notion, and sort of looking at it as something this, as being animistic possession, as being the strength of something that is constructed, being constructed as a part of forming the American culture rather than fitting into it. So that in the same way, um, you come to Holland as who you are. Um, if, there, if enough of you that come and you sort of insist on certain things, well, Dutch society will change. Yeah. You know, so that's what I'm kind of saying. So you can you can try to simulate as much as you want, and it might be easier for you. And it'll probably be for people who look like me. But um, so that you have to remember that that's always a part of it too. Um, but Dutch society will change anyway. We're seeing it all over all over Europe as Europe starts to deal with uh, multiculturalism, and uh, and in some ways it's dealt with in a very um, Interesting way, and other ways there's the usual uh, nativism and, and you know people you know segregation of different kinds, new, new ghettos kind of forming out there. Where is the place to have the ghetto around here? You know, it, it's somewhere it's in the east. It, it's the Belma. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's something. There's, so this kind of thing, I think that. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that's where that's maybe. I don't mean that this is a political discussion, but I guess the thing is about these kinds of pieces that they do bring up some political issues. And I sort of like the idea that technology could bring up these political issues and that we start to, technology of this kind, excuse me, starts to bring up these political issues. It was very clear to me a couple of years ago, I went to a UNESCO conference held in um, Esson outside Paris, this fancy little town in South Paris where we were in it was, built, it was done there because of the technological high school over there, and they brought um, basically technology, music technology people from all over Europe, I mean, as far as ways Cyprus and Albania to, uh, to Norway and Finland. And I represent Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can I go back to the point that you said? Oh, yeah. when, when you were talking about, I couldn't recognize something. It was like the interactivity or something. What was the program? What was the program? What was the program? How did the program help? I heard some people help. Help, meaning help what? What was the program? 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 Oh, okay. Well, you know, it's, it, it, well, yeah. So they were performing? Oh, you mean who was performing? Is it completely, is it completely computer produced? Uh, well, except for the saxophone player, yeah. Except for the saxophone Yeah. So you said, and then so they, and then the saxophone player uh, it, it encourages the, the computer to accompany him in a certain way by by blowing the sax. Well, you could, you, could, you react. Well, you know, um, you, you could think of it in terms of encouragement. In other in other words, if if you're doing it <coughs> and you start to hear something that um, is somehow related to what you're doing, but you may not. Sometimes you do, and sometimes you don't. Um, but you see, the fact that you do it means that the possibility is there. So that actually encourages you. I don't know if you're encouraging it, but somehow the fact that there is this, there are these range of potential relationships that the computer can take means that it encourages you, perhaps as a soloist, to also take a range of potential relationships so to what the computer is doing. In real time, as the as the saxophone player is is playing. Uh, what are the inputs to the computer? Oh, you mean like technical? Well, there's the usual junk, you know, pitch followers and all okay. that. Okay, it's the computer is listening to the saxophone. Right, okay. right, right. right. No, no, like no manual. No manual. Well, you know, I was never good at that, sitting at the computer and, you know, right. Right. So the is accompanying the saxophone. Well, you could look at it that way. Sometimes it's well, leading right. the saxophone. And so, of course, the saxophone stops, the computer takes a solo, and it knows it's by itself. Well, that's what it's the solo. Yeah, you get a solo. Okay. All right, Mike. Yeah. Yes. Well, a related question was, I was going to go back to your comment about 
certain type of programming as a means of um, called self-determination. And I think that's a very different attitude than I've seen in a lot of computer programs that I've encountered here in Holland, which is computer programs that seem to be just a modern day version of very old and compositional and uh, rules. And you know, when you enter this, a certain amount of things will happen and you don't really have a lot of choice in the matter. Can you talk about some of the things you've done programming-wise that put more self-determination into this whole matter as opposed to just... Well, what's the self-determination out there? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> now there's even a formula. I'm not asking you to for a formula, but some of the things you've done that work. You know, it's a, it's a hard question to answer because there really is no self-determination out there. Um, there, there, are, there are a set of... Um, in other words, I could, I, could, I could tell you that in a month or in three months, I could say, well, if you did this, you might tend to um, get there uh, in a certain sense. But I think there's more of a question of, well, what is your attitude toward those sorts of things? In other words, if, if computer programs are a medium of expression, then what's going to come out is um, who you are. And if who you are is a person that likes to listen to people who tell you what to do, then you're going to make computer programs that do that. Um, uh, or if you adopt you know, the information retrieval paradigm, then what you'll get is something when you make a simple input, you'll get a simple output. Okay. Um, what I found was a criticism of this piece, which I plead guilty, is that oftentimes the relationship is oblique between what the saxophone player is doing and what the computer is doing, often very oblique to the point where uh, someone, quote, cannot tell. Um, and um, that is related to the, the question of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> yeah. That is to say that if, if, if it came, how would we know? Um, if you think about, some people can listen to Albert Eiler and they don't hear any intelligence there at all. So if the if the extraterrestrial thing came in, it sounded like Albert. They say, ah, oh, can't use it, you know. But if it sounded like Bach, then they'd be interested. Well, mine would be the reverse. I would say, well, oh, this Bach thing, this is obviously a reflection from some other planet. This Albert thing, let's pay attention to it. Um, so that finally, what I'm saying is that um, I can talk about that. But I think I think it sort of be um, beyond the scope of what I have to say right now, which is that um, um, there are these kind of issues that turn up, and that there is no really simple way to sort of there's no subroutine for that. And what ends up happening is that that comes out of the composite piece. So there's a global notion that it things that you do take decisions that you take at very small levels that don't mean very much, end up adding up to this other conception of the idea. So, maybe I can put it like that. Uh, George, can I uh, try and um, open the discussion up, perhaps to people who are not directly from the musical culture, because there are a lot of things that you've been throwing into the arena that I think several members of the audience uh, latch you on to. And I can say, so um, your image of the drama, um, the drum is there, therefore the fact that the drum is virtually real is, is secondary. I think this is something that was experienced in an interesting way by, by a group of us um, about five years ago working with virtual puppets with motion capture pilot puppets. And um, we actually began with puppeteers who felt that switching over to virtual puppets was going to be the most liberating thing that would ever happen to them mm-hmm. um, because they would no longer have to deal with gravity and, and direction and describing trajectories. And then once they discovered that they had to fully predefine the entities that they were going to be moving, and that it was just as constraining as we want physical puppetry, um, then they had to find another set of um, constraints to run up against as instrumentists in a way. Mm-hmm. And, and the glitches that you were talking about, programming the glitches, we had, we had lag phenomena, of course, with our motion capture system. And we had to learn to work through these glitches and integrate them into the personalities and you're talking about these kinds of uh, emerg- subjectivities that are emerging through your programming processes and through the inherent glitches and learning to deal with these in a dialogic situation. So I think that um, 
for, for a lot of people here who are not directly from the musical sphere, these, these are general and extremely interesting issues. So I was wondering if you could elaborate on that for one thing, and perhaps some uh, Tim and, and Roman, uh, we have a juggler and a puppeteer here who are very interested in these issues. Um, it might be interesting to get a dialogue on that one. The other, the other thing that um, I found uh, would be good to maybe come back to was your um, breaking point between prosthetic and encounter technology. And I'm really wondering to what extent encounter technology is not just integrated prosthetic technology. Um, I'm not talking about Steve Mann wearing 50 kilos of megabytes on his head because he's no cool that he's a kind of prosthetic encounter. But um, is, is um, incarnative technology like stalkwalkers in, in the land in the south of France, um, they are developing a whole morphological interaction with the environment because they have thoroughly integrated these prostheses. So, mm. so it becomes a part of who they are. Yeah. Well, that's a very good point because um, for the most part, the prosthetic uh, device um, often in these technologies is, is precisely meant to be seen as prosthetic. Um, it, it, of course, there's a way of incarnating the prosthetic device. Um, but I guess I'm speaking more about devices that are literally meant to be this way. In other words, there's a, there's a notion that we, we are we are encouraged to look at this as a prosthetic device rather than as something that has been and we're encouraged to see the place where they join and to look at that place as being an important part of the experience of, of looking at this one. Um, another way, of course, is that somehow we're, we're, that all that is kind of hidden from you. So then we're encouraged to say, well, isn't, then, then what's fun about it is that it's been hidden. And that we sort of say, well, isn't that, it's just very much like that. Um, but I think that the, the, um, what I'm saying about the, the incarnate aspect, what I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's um, the extent to which you've got, well, David Wessel came up with this idea a while ago of controllers that learn, which I think is kind of in that vein for me, as, especially as a metaphor. And I don't know how far they got <coughs> with the controllers that learn. I mean, one thing is, well, if they learn so much that they get away from you, then how do you control the controllers? Well, I mean, I can't really, but I mean, I was intrigued by the idea. Well, yeah, it, it's, uh, um, I mean, thinking about having a kind of really symbiotic relationship with your instrument, I mean, let's think about what a guitarist does messing around with his action on the guitar or saxophonist is always filling with the reeds and the top keys and that sort of thing and adapting that, uh, that device to its own uh, physiology and the needs of the kind of style he wants to play in so that, that kind of uh, adaptation of the instrument goes on in a you know, very natural way but we might ask not to but could we have an instrument that was in some sense auto-adapt? That is, it would, would it learn in conjunction with the unit? Well, uh, we've done some experiments along those lines, and they're kind of, it's kind of difficult. Uh, and what happens is if the instrument's changing, then it sort of does slip out from under you, just as you've uh, described. It's not the same thing, so you have a hard time adapting to it. Yeah, so it's a real control for your Well, Jeff Hinton and his group in Toronto have uh, tried this thing as well, and they had a very hard time when the, uh, they wanted to teach a glove controller to speak, to control the speech synthesizer. In fact, I brought the video of that with me so I can show that uh, tomorrow. It's very, it's very interesting video. Well, it turns out they just had to sort of either have the system adapt very slowly. In other words, it couldn't, it, its learning curve would be much slower than the human uh, learning curve. Or in fact, even to the point of just making manual changes to its behavior. Uh, so, but I think, 
I think it's, it's worthwhile pursuing. It's just that we have to realize that the, the uh, instrument itself couldn't learn uh, at a faster rate or change its behavior at a faster rate than the user. I think just can well, well, instruments. Well, also instruments change in all kinds of ways. I mean, you're dealing with you're dealing with a physical with, uh, with, with a physical instrument. You're dealing with something that in which a lot of stuff that you're dealing with is a part of the environment in terms of physical things. You've got to move air. You've got to like you've got a bow. It's going against a string. It's making resistance to doing all these kinds of things. When you're building some uh, virtual instrument, you have to sort of make that environment happen. And it seems to me, as long as you're making that environment happen, why don't you also make the environment that has caused it to be able to talk back to you in some sense? And I guess that's why I'm making the fault line between the prosthetic object. I mean, if your if your prosthetic hand suddenly decided to grab something you didn't tell it to, you know, <laughs> it's suddenly in the sense it has its own sort of life, and you have to say, well, would you mind grabbing this side? You know, and, and then you sort of deal with that. Can you still find the specific? It's, it's well, I can't at that point. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It becomes, it becomes something else. In other words, in other words, there is a sense when you're playing. Uh, uh, an instrument that you know well, and this is a whole other issue, by the way. Part of the problem with the, the controllers that learn, at least as far as I can see, is that well, if they change so fast, how do you learn? Mm-hmm. You know, in other words, I've been playing the trombone for 25 <coughs> years, and I still feel there are a lot of things I can't do, or will never be able to do, or things I'd like to do, or things if I don't know that you can do. But if the instrument sort of changes radically this way tomorrow, uh, and plus my body is changing, um, so at a certain point, I have to try to deal with that as a part of it, and. And maybe when there's a part here when you, in your essay where you talk about the need to sort of develop these things with use. Well, you know, that's, that's a really long time to use them. And most of the time they become obsolete or you change the programming. So that the amount of time that someone has spent practicing with these virtual instruments is nothing compared to like, uh, you know, the amount of time I spent practicing or uh, 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 the trombone or something. So, and even, and I don't practice nearly as much as like Francis does. I mean, we're talking about somebody who really practices all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I mean, so, so basically, what I'm saying is that there is that. But go ahead. There is what? What? No, I guess. I guess what, 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 what is interesting is that, yeah. that you, you think of developing a, a, you know, a, a learning curve. Whereas uh, I'm curious if you um, designed a, a decay curve. You know, like all the traditional uh, acoustic instruments sort of you know, wear out and destroy. Self-destruct after a while by being a new instrument. Have you ever thought of, of building something in your software instead of a learning curve like a decay curve, which is a very natural process? You mean where somehow the things uh, well, yes, die. Because, <laughs> of, because of you know playing uh, very often with uh, you know if, if well, you say know, that you have to